This is the Biz of Wealth. Challenges, rumblings, and evolution of the wealth management industry. Welcome to a business of wealth. Today, I had the honor of sitting down with Habib Moldatiro. He is a member of the founding team and CIO of V Square Quantitative Management, a subsidiary of Valor Equity Partners. He's an accomplished and dedicated senior executive combining a science academy background with an extensive investment management experience gained throughout a career at major global financial services companies in Europe and the US. He's an adjunct professor at New York University, a 20-year quantitative investment management veteran who garnered major recognition as an expert in portfolio management across the market spectrum and accrued a wealth of knowledge of the capital markets the regulatory and operational frameworks. He successfully led numerous strategic initiatives, resulting in investment solutions and products for investors across the globe, many of those focused on environmental, social, and good governance matters. He ardently believes in the value of building and maintaining a two-way bridge between academia and the industry. And this was a very interesting conversation we had about how to best manage asset management businesses. Without further ado, here is Habib. Habib, welcome to the Business of Wealth. Thank you so much for being here with me. Uh, thank you, Ale, Alejandra. Very nice, uh, very nice of you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here with you on this sunny day in Miami <laughs> and uh, in Chicago where I sit. Well, uh, I've heard great things about you, so I'm excited to get this started. So tell me just a little bit about you. Um, I always say, what got you here and what's here? I just heard, you know, a very recent move for, for you. So tell me a little bit about it. Yes, um, that's that's a good question. Here is actually Chicago, Illinois, uh, where I moved. I recently moved two months ago. But uh, to get here, it's been a long road. Um, I uh, I am originally from Benin in West Africa. I lived in uh, three countries, uh, no, in more countries than that, but in three, on three continents, in Africa, in Europe, and uh, in the United States. This is year 15 in the United States. I, uh, I spent, uh, the, let's say, the first 15 years uh, in the US, in uh, New York, New York, New York, and now I'm in Chicago. Before that, yes, I spent my early childhood in, uh, in Africa, in Benin, then uh, went to school, high school, uh, university and the whole nine years in uh, in France, and started working in France for for a British company uh, HSBC, British or or from Hong Kong, depending who you talk to, mm. as global asset manager. I uh, I was a first a trader there. Um, I'm a quantitative uh, investor uh, by trade. This is uh, you know how you qualify the type of asset management that I do. So I'm a portfolio manager. I spent 11 years total at HSBC, a couple of years at JP Morgan, a few more years at uh, a smaller, at smaller asset managers. But the common trait and the common thread up until, up until now has always been revolving around portfolio management and everything that's, uh, that's around that. So now why Chicago? It's because um, I uh, co-founded a company uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, the name is V Square Quantitative Management, and uh, it is headquartered here in Chicago. My partner, uh, the the founder, is also based here. Uh, most of our backers are here in Chicago. I could have stayed in New York. I love New York. It's not a cliche, uh, but it just made more sense uh, to move uh, here. And I can tell you, I'm not seeing the difference now because you know, uh, instead of being uh, uh, sequestered in my apartment in New York. I'm sequestered in my home here in Chicago. <laughs> that's that's the sad reality. But why, um, why finance? How did you land into portfolio management? Why finance? That's uh, there's a there's a few stories. The the main story is that uh, so my background is really engineer. So I was a statistician, math, mathematics, physics. That's my whole uh, my whole academic background. And uh, coming at the end of my uh, engineering school, 
uh, when you're an engineer, actually mathematics or physics or statistics, there's a lot of fields where you can apply uh, what you learned. You could do you could do in bio in biology. You can do it in uh, in uh, pure engineering work, aerospatial, aerospatial, or it could be also a Formula One if you like racing. Uh, there's a lot of things, in the, and there's also finance. And uh, the 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 reason why I came to finance is because this was an area that uh, was totally foreign to me, and uh, I like challenges. You know, I was growing up. I remember when I was a teenager, even even earlier than that, uh, I would be in the car with my dad. He would have the financial news playing on the radio. Although that would be it's not English words, but that was French words, but it's kind of the same idea. They would be speaking, uh, you know, a regular language, but uh, after five minutes or 10 minutes of listening to what they're saying, I would have no understanding of what they were talking, they were talking about. So I always wanted to uh, kind of decipher uh, this field. So I had some opportunities to actually study finance. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to move to finance to kind of uh, apply. Uh, all those uh, things that I learned in engineering school to the uh, to the field of finance. Now, how do you apply that? It's more, you know, you use uh, statistics or mathematics to try to predict returns or to uh, to help in uh, your decision making. And that, now the that story <laughs> touches me because I, you know, part of my work is always, you know, may simplifying communications in finance. You know, uh, why do we make concepts? so difficult or even products uh, <laughs> that are yeah. so complicated. Right? That, that is true. That is true. And uh, it's not, you know, I, I have I have a big circle of friends or, or family and there's a lot of people who don't uh, understand any of the concepts, even if it's, uh, if it's easy. I'm just talking about even financial uh, literacy. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that's totally natural to them. And so they don't really understand, you know, for them, finance, I mean, the only understanding is like, you know, it stops with, you know, the mortgage or it stops with the consumer loan or it stops with just banking uh, with your local bank. So you decided to launch this company. Why? And what do you do? What are you, what are you doing? So the company V-Square is a, is a global asset manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, So global asset management is, is what I've done so far to year 20 now of my career. It's been 20 years. Actually, on December the 4th, it's going to be 20 years. I've done it uh, successfully uh, with uh, other companies for large companies. So I've, 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 had quite, I've enjoyed quite, of, uh, quite of a lot of success. The second point is that um, even within those organizations, as large as it could be, you always had to, be, to have an entrepreneurship uh, spirit to uh, succeed within those organizations. So it's not, it's not always a cliche that you have the organization that's behind you, that's going to help you. It's more you trying to uh, move the needle within the organization, trying to execute a vision, uh, trying to, uh, to do well while you're navigating uh, the, uh, the organization. So that's the second point. And then the third point, I just thought, and we just thought because I partnered with um, a former colleague and he's also a very good friend, we really thought that we could replicate the success that we had the company at at all the companies that we work with or we work at if we just did it for ourselves uh, because we knew how to do it. We knew how to uh, how to succeed. We uh, we knew also how to be entrepreneurs and uh, those are things that we've done and we just think that you know, the combination of all this uh, within a smaller organization would, uh, would make sense. How has this background in science and engineering informed your portfolio management in a more like in an actual way? Like what have you used that has worked uh, from your science background? From the science, I mean, if I'm just talking about uh, characteristics or features, uh, that would be uh, the rigor that you, uh, you and discipline that you acquire uh, while you're going through all the formation and the education and uh, all the projects and the research. Uh, And you have that relentlessness uh, to to kind of going and uh, try to to find what you're looking for and to make it work. And there's also something that I don't discount is the ability to learn. So you can take any book or you can take any field uh, that you don't know much about 
And uh, I'm even talking within finance. And you take any field that you don't know much about, and then you just go and uh, you learn and uh, you try to apply uh, all those, um, I would say, the, the, really the, the, the discipline and rigor that you acquire for your education to, uh, to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing is like in, ter in terms of methodology, and I don't want to get too much into the, the, the quantitative methodology, but that would be, it's really predictive models. It's all based on mathematics and statistics, probabilities, and then you try to inform your decisions to uh, based on you know uh, how much you think that this or that company is a uh, is value and what's the real value of the of the company and you try to take advantage of that. So so far, um, what have you learned? What are the challenges of launching a new portfolio management firm in this environment and in general? <laughs> Yes, so the, to take a step back, the, what's really unique about uh, the, the firm that uh, we launched is that it is at the intersection of uh, a new quantitative investing and uh, what we call ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance. Uh, just because we think and we believe that taking into account considerations like uh, issues about environment, about social issues, and, and taking into account uh, governance issues help uh, mitigate the risk in your portfolios and also help uh, increase uh, long-term, uh, can help increase the, the value of your portfolios. And so I would say the, the challenge is we did not, when we launched, when we were talking about launching the company, we did not plan about, we did not plan the pandemic. We didn't say, oh, or we did not do it in the middle of the pandemic. We basically launched it and then the pandemic happened. But uh, what happened is that the pandemic really um, reinforced our interest and reinforced our determination in ma making this work. Just because when you talk about environmental or just sustainability, you, you see a lot of connections with uh, what has been happening, uh, whether the pandemic itself, uh, what created it, uh, you know, you can argue that this is uh, due to an, an the environment crisis because some, uh, some uh, animals are being pushed out from their natural habitat. So it creates those, those, uh, those type of uh, uh, possibilities for uh, viruses. Uh, the second thing is that uh, when everyone went in and tried to uh, abide by the stay at home uh, order, mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in the world, we saw uh, the um, effect and the impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I remember sometimes I went, to, I went to the beach and I could see, I was in New York and I could see the Empire State from where I was standing and it was not possible before. Uh, so that means, you know, there are things that can be done to uh, kind of help the environment. We are really uh, creating our own uh, climate change. So those are things that kind of more resonate more with uh, what's happening. And finally, not, not the least, is all the social issues and social unrest. And you, you, we saw that we saw it unfold. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the essential workers. Uh, most of the time, you know, people who were fortunate enough to work for banks, for corporates, uh, they just went back home or someone just went to their secondary home, stayed at home, while a lot of people who are less fortunate. I'm talking about delivery guys. I'm talking about post office. I'm talking about uh, all those construction workers. They they had to go to work and they were exposed to that virus. And uh, if you just look at New York, and I'm sure it's the same everywhere in the world, uh, that virus disproportionately affected uh, people with lower income uh, socially. Yeah. And uh, and the second social issue is uh, all those unrest that we saw here in the in the U.S. and also in uh, everywhere in the world, uh, with the succession of um, of deaths of uh, black and armed men or women uh, at the hand of uh, of uh, police officers. So how do you translate that into you know into interest from investors? on your ESG product. I know that that's generally the challenge, you know. Um, everybody can say that they are on for these, you know, um, these causes and for yes. fixing all this. But, you know, beyond uh, donating to a charity, the moment in which you ask them to use, you know, their portfolio, their investment portfolio to actually back up that philosophy, that's another story. 
No, that's a, that's that's a very fair point. And uh, you know, just to to say it uh, differently is that if you are an investor, I, and I ask you, oh, do you care about the environment? Do you care about social issues? Yeah, you will all say yes. You know, why not? But uh, if I tell you, if I go back to you after three months and I say, yeah, I, I, I made some investments for you, but actually I could have earned you 5%, but I'm only earning a 3% because I, uh, I had to uh, not invest in, uh, in uh, some of the securities because, you know, they were not up to the standard uh, in terms of environment or social. If you're an investor, you're not going to be happy. So, you know, we, we, we totally know that. And the way we do it is really, uh, you know, it's, of course, we want to do good. But as an investment manager, our first mission is uh, our, our first responsibility, the fiduciary duty, is really to, uh, to maximize the return the best, uh, the best way possible. So what we do is that you cannot do, you cannot take into account all the factors, all the ESG factors. You have to pick your battles. And uh, so what we did is that we have identified some uh, factors that we believe are material, uh, meaning they are financially relevant. So taking into account those factors, we know can not only mitigate the risk, like reduce the risk that you are, you can be exposed to, but also help you uh, with the value of your portfolio. Or at least, you know, you get the same type of return that you were expecting, uh, which is fine. There's that third dimension, which is in terms of, uh, you know, how comfortable, uh, what do you, uh, do you want to do good based on some, some of the metrics? Uh, you can respond yes. So it's, it's possible to do good on some of the metrics and yet to retain the type of uh, expected returns that you are aspiring to. And also to reduce the type of uh, to reduce some of the risk because you know to tell you the truth there are in, in finance we usually look at only financial risks but there are a lot of non-financial risks that are going to become or that are going to have financial consequences in the future and those are things that we'd like to reduce right now identify and reduce so tell me in the last two years we, we like to speak here a lot about the management of asset management firms, you know, the growth, the challenges, the structuring challenges, the sell, selling challenges, the marketing challenges. What have been your greatest challenges and what has surprised you so far in terms of, you know, managing a firm coming from the corporate world? It, it's very particular. You know, we spoke about COVID earlier. Uh, I would say that's the biggest surprise because you you never explain to you you never expect actually to start a company and uh, have have to weather uh, a pandemic of a bigger proportion. So that was that was the biggest surprise. But like I say, uh, we I always see a crisis as a as also an opportunity. And uh, you know when you think about companies, most of the I would say the best, the most successful companies today were were founded or started in times of crisis. So my and my take is like if we if we do okay, if we are doing okay in times of crisis, uh, the ceiling, uh, the sky would be really the limit uh, when things get better. That's that's a, that, that was the first surprise. Uh, I would say, and you know that that was. I mean that was that was a big one. That's that's really uh, the. <laughs> that's everybody's. That's in everybody's list. So that's a that's a big one. And 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 just to go, to go to go back COVID, in. Let's talk. You know. Yeah, just COVID. Can just we? COVID. Can we? Can we do that? I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> the management, and, the day to day of of an asset management firm. You know what? What's what's the challenge? What's that? What's the most difficult part? You mean in times of uh, in times of COVID or outside in, uh, in normal times? Normal times. In normal times, um, we I I mean you know what I like to tell people is that uh, we uh, when when we started we started after a career of uh, twenty years for one and 19, 18, 19 years for for the other for the other so we know exactly where we were working. Uh, to and uh, what we were working into, so that's that's the first point. So and uh, so before, so I can I, I can argue that it's not an idea that we uh, we had for three months and just we just, we just decided to do it. It's uh, it's arguably something that's been in the making for the last twenty years, or even more. And uh, throughout all those twenty years, you know, we always maintain a table. Uh, 
and uh, with two columns, one of the do's and one of the don'ts. Mm. So the don'ts are basically things that we saw people implement in the past in terms of people management, in terms of process management, in terms of uh, the way of doing things that either was not successful or actually it just led to an impasse. So we know that we're not even going to try that. Let's go deeper into that. I like it. Okay. Yeah, don't. Come on. One don't? Yes. One or two or three. Uh, <laughs> so my, my, my favorite don't is that, uh, you know, you don't need a PowerPoint to make a point. You know, incorporate, incorporate, uh, incorporate lives. And in my corporate lives, I know we would, add, uh, we would ask a question to people. They would go back and come back to us with 40 slides. Uh, where they spent a lot of time, they just added more problems. They would come to you with issues and challenges and uh, and risks, no answer. And then you will have another another meeting to try to understand what they meant with those slides. Go back, <laughs> write the minutes, and then you know it's just like non-ending. And I can tell you, in the large companies I I, I work I work at, it's not the fault of the company. It's just also the, the part, the, the fact that, you know, the, those are big and the more people you have, the more ideas you have to, to grasp. So it, it, it's really hard. You know, you do a meeting and then minutes of the meeting and then uh, another meeting to talk about the minutes and then another meeting. So things takes forever. And where you really need, so being nimble uh, like we are now, we can go faster. And like I say, we know the do and the don't. And this is one of the don'ts uh, I, I gave you. And same thing, another, another, another don't, it's more like a do. It's like, you know, when we, um, when we have an idea, we want, uh, we want that idea to go from ideation to a product in uh, less than three months. Okay. This is what I would like. How I've did been, you come up with that number? How did I come up with that number? Yeah. It's, just ex- it's just experience uh, because of uh, everything that needs to, to do. Actually, we, ideally, we would like 45 days, but we know it's not always easy. We also have to compose with like, a regulator. We have to compose with uh, uh, outside uh, outside uh, partners that we work with. Uh, that's why. But all this in contrast with what you can have when you work for a big company where you can spend a lot of time actually more time, I would say 80% of the time, convincing stakeholders internally while you have a a client waiting for you for a solution. And he's already, you know, he's already a buy-in. He just wants to do it. And uh, you have the solution, but you have to spend time. And then it could take six months, it could take a year. And sometimes the client is patient, sometimes he's not. Right. And do you use any type of philosophy that you like, you know, all of those there are many um, mindset or process books out there that talk about how to launch products and how to iterate, etc. Do you use any of those or is this just built on your experience? It's, it's really built on an experience, you know, and because, you know, we also evolved. We also evolved. We saw, you know, I, I, I navigated large companies. I navigated also smaller companies. Uh, the challenges are not the same, you know, uh, being a, sometimes when you're a big company, you're like, I wish I was in a smaller company, everything would be faster, nimbler. And then when you're in a small company, you're like, I wish I would be in a large company, then I would have more resources. Why? <laughs> I, can, I can be faster, but I'm not rich because I need, uh, I need the money of large companies, the, the backup. So there's always uh, pluses and minuses. And uh, throughout my career and actually our respective careers, we were able to kind of uh, find uh, the sweet spots for a lot of those things. And I, I can tell you what we were able to do in the last few months. I know for a fact it would take normally one year or two years minimum to get off the ground if we didn't have the experience and if we didn't have the success we had uh, before and the, and the know-how. And, you know, part of the, the success also is, uh, you know, because we had failures too. It's also part of the game, you know, and because you had those failures, you learn lessons and then you can, uh, you can apply them. And, you know, today when we take a direction, and we say, are we going to do it this way? We are able to say, no, actually, it's not going to work. or It's going to be too long. Or just because down the road, uh, the product is not going to be viable or we're not going to be able to invest it. Uh, those are the type of um, lessons and uh, expertise and experience that we have. Uh, on top, of course, of the books and all the seminars, everything we've done. That's 20 years is a lot of, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. 
So, and in terms of team management, what are the, you know, you mentioned, you know, I have in the do's and don'ts, the team, what, what, you know, what's your philosophy? It's empowering. It's really, uh, it's, you know, I, I really consider ourselves as leaders, but we also want to be empowering leaders. And meaning that, you know, I, we don't, I, I don't believe that, you know, you are just a leader because you have the title or because somebody puts you in position and say, oh, you're the boss, uh, now manage. People have to follow. Um, I don't really believe in that style of leadership. Uh, I saw it, you know, sometimes, you know, it doesn't respect. But at the end of the day, uh, when you're managing people, what you want is that they, uh, is that is to bring the best out of them, is to really maximize uh, the, the potential. So the type of leadership I believe in is uh, is a leadership where you really empower people. Yeah, you know, you you establish communication. It has to go two ways. Uh, people should not be afraid to uh, to critic to critique you, and uh, they should not uh, be also afraid of taking criticism. Uh, this is very important. And so uh, the way I define I, I define leadership is really that ability to inspire people and uh, you know and to uh, to, to make them uh, know the potential that they have in them and uh, realize that potential. I like that. I, you know, I've had in the past and I, I've seen that happen in corporate world in some medium-sized companies in financial services where you get a lot of the, what I like to call the prima donnas. Yes. Um, in, you know, in which that culture of starship, of, you know, raising stars, I find it's sometimes not in best interest of clients or the organization. How do you avoid that? Because, you know, it's very easy to get into that van wagon when you are. It's very easy, but, you know, it's character. It's really character because, uh, you know, we know we know who we are. We, we've known each other for, uh, I'm talking about the leadership. We've known each other for more than 15 years. So it's all good from there. So now what you want to pay attention to is to the people that you're bringing on board. One thing I can tell you, Alejandra, is that we are never going to be a 100,000 people uh, company. Right. We are always, yeah, we are going to be lean and we know how to do it being lean. When I say lean is uh, 20 people max, maybe 25 is really, we go crazy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we, we are not going to be successful. We are going to be successful and you, we, we can even be, you can manage tons of assets just being five people or six people. Uh, the reason why we're going to be a bit more is because we really want to advance research and uh, have researchers just promoting research, doing research, writing papers, providing thought leadership, because we think that this is also our way to, uh, to have a voice and to put our thumb on the scales. Uh, so now when you have such a a small group of people that you have to manage, this is where you really want to pay attention to people you bring on board. And same thing, like I say, 20 years in the industry, we almost know a lot of, we know a lot of people, we almost know everyone. And we know who we want to work with, we want who we do not want to work with, uh, I mean, who we cannot really work with. And this is, you know, uh, the type of things uh, that you can do. And, and once the people are on board, of course, you want to make, you want to pay attention to, uh, to uh, to how it's going, and like I say, you know, the, the minute you you uh, you let people shine, uh, it's all really good for not only for the company and also for what we're trying to achieve. Because at the end of the day, this is about the uh, the the mission. It's about what we're doing. It's not about ourselves. And I, I would say, uh, you could be you could be the president of the United States, for instance, and uh, or the presence of any country, and you don't need to know everything about everything. What you need to is to have the ability to uh, surround yourself with people who are really good at what they do, and you have the ability to uh, listen to them. Because if you don't listen to them, you're just paying them for nothing. So I'd like to ask this, you know, to close uh, a couple of questions. You know, mm -hmm. basically, you're very good at you know, what you do and your career, clearly. Uh, what are you not very good at? I'm not very good at, I'm not good with choices. That, uh, that's my little confession. To, to, give you, to give you, when I say choices in everyday life, uh, of course, uh, to give you an example, it's all the contrast between being in France and also being in, being in the US. 
if I go, if I walk into a coffee shop in France and I say, I want a coffee, they would go back, give me a coffee and I would leave. If I walk in a Starbucks here and I say, I want a coffee, I'm going to have so many choices and so many questions to answer up until I get my coffee. <laughs> okay, uh, so do you want uh, dark roast? Do you want, uh, you know, ch chicken roast? Do you want uh, red roast? And then so say, oh, do you want milk? Or no milk. Do you want sugar? No sugar. The cup, do, how do you want it? Do you want it closed, open? Okay. Well, that's a way of saying you like things simple. I like to keep things simple. Good. <laughs> exactly. And another fun one for you. So if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive? Heaven exists. Okay. Heaven does exist. Have to say neutral. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I know. I want him to, to tell me that. That oh. heaven does exist. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I get yeah. it. Okay. That's cool. And I like the irony of it. Yeah. So when I get there, I want him to say, yeah, heaven does exist. So that means I'm there. And uh, he just opened the door and I'm just going to run into it. That's cool. Okay. Okay. This was fun. Thank you so much. And My uh, pleasure. I look forward to more from you in the future. Uh, likewise. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you.